Good day, brothers and sisters. Thank you for tuning in to Sunday School Bonanza. We're here to bring you a gospel doctrine review or prep and get you going. And we certainly hope this is useful. Uh, please let us know how we're doing over at thisweekinmormons.com or shoot us an email, contact at thisweekinmormons.com. We'd love to hear from you. We really appreciate it. I'm joined this week by uh, the wonderful man, Dustin Homer. Hey, everybody. Here he is, folks. The soon-to-be honest Dustin Homer. <laughs> it's true. We don't delve too Finally. much into those things, but uh, great things are happening for Dustin. Uh, we're glad to have you here. <laughs> so happy to I'm be here. I'm always glad to have Dustin's my homie. I love having Dustin here to do this. I have kind of a bromance crush on Dustin, but he knows this. Yeah, it's reciprocal. Okay, as long as he's comfortable with it. Now the world knows. Yeah, so lesson 36 is the one we're talking about this week, and it's called The Desert Shall Rejoice and Blossom as the Rose. And I say that in almost sort of a farcical sense. But it's a good it's a good lesson. Dustin and I were talking before. It seems to be a little bit more of just a, a history lesson as opposed to one that evaluates key doctrinal points. And to put this in perspective, we don't have like a reference section of Doctrine and Covenants, for example. There's right. some, some citations of Doctrine and Covenants, but it's not like we're primarily in section 106 today or anything like that. We're just uh, we're talking about a, a handful of things. The main purpose of this lesson is to help class members understand how they have been blessed by the sacrifices of the early saints in the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, much like a few lessons ago, we talked about being learning from the examples of the pioneers who crossed the plains. Now we're learning uh, of things in the Salt Lake Valley. The main things we're going to talk about today are sort of the, the initial time in the valley, the construction of the Salt Lake Temple, uh, colonizing other areas, and uh, missionary work a little bit at the end. So... Lots of good things to talk about. I'm excited yeah. to be here. And a lot of parallels to draw, I think, that are that are really relevant to our lives now. Yeah. Interesting to think about and, and try and figure out how it fits. So on uh, on July 28th of 1847, this was only four days after the, the saints arrived in the Salt Lake Valley, was when Brigham Young stood on the spot where the Salt Lake Temple now stands. And he famously struck his cane to the ground and said, right here will stand the temple of our God. <laughs> In my Sean Connery impression. <laughs> he had um, a flair for the dramatic, didn't he? Well, he did. Well, President uh, Young. Whenever I think about Brigham Young, since we don't have video footage of him, I think of the movie The Mountain of the Lord. Right, We've right. seen that one. I was thinking, it was like, I will not move from this place until the Lord has shown me what to do. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And we'll get to that. About. That is, of course, when they have a problem with some of the, the quarrying and the stones and stuff like that. But I really do love the history of the Salt Lake Temple. It represented... Even more sacrifice. We saw a sacrifice with the Kirtland Temple, obviously. Great sacrifice with the Nauvoo Temple. They, they frantically finished it up and dedicated it so that they could do ordinances before they were basically driven out of Nauvoo. And then the temple itself was struck by lightning and burned down, and a lot of bad things happened with it. The Salt Lake Temple was no different. I mean, how long did it take to build? 40 years. 40 years. I can't fathom that. As I am not 40 years old, I can't imagine being this far into my life and still saying, we're still building that thing? Seriously. Seriously. That's Two score. That is a long, 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 long time. So they surveyed the spot in the center of the city. And of course, as you know, Salt Lake City today focuses on the temple. In fact, most of the Salt Lake Valley focuses on the temple. And the, the grid system they have there, even addresses way down in, you know, like Draper and wherever else in the Salt Lake Valley, all come from their coordinates of West Temple, North Temple, South Temple, East Temple. That is the focal point of the city. Um, and we joke about this. I've heard many people say, well, of course, it's because it's supposed to make you remember that, you know, everything leads to the temple. Everything, And we say it with a faux dramatic sense. But I like that reminder, actually. Yeah. I mean, if you you can be somewhere in the Salt Lake Valley and be way down at like 123rd South and, and 10, 107th West or whatever like that and be like, well, I know that I'm approximately so many blocks west of and so many blocks south of the Salt Lake Temple. Yeah. Which is a great thing to remember. And I actually like that that tradition is held even as it's developed in the modern days, you know, they haven't just restructured street name. This is and urban well, planning. But, but if, I mean, even, I mean, even beyond that though, we're, we're talking about literal fulfillment of prophecy, right? I mean, the mountain of the Lord's house and all nations flow into it. And I mean, even that idea sort of resonates with me when you talk about that, that, you know, it's built to be the center, the focal point of that whole region. Yeah. That's, and that's pretty going. remarkable. And I like that you referenced the Isaiah right there, you know, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be built upon the mountains and, and all that stuff. And how do you not see that when you go to Utah, when you yeah. know you're in the valley that's already above 4,000 feet as is, and you've got these beautiful mountains surrounding it, you know, the immediate Wasatch range right there. And, uh, and you really see how different that Salt Lake Temple was. Brigham Young wanted a temple that would endure the, the millennium easily. They wanted to stand the test of time. And a huge part of that, of course, is the foundation. And that's no different than what we see today. But, you know, we hear these stories. I don't know how many years 
exactly it took them just to lay the foundation of the temple, but it was... Like a decade or so. It was a long time. Yeah. And then, of course, you ran into the problems of them having to cover it all up when the U.S. troops were coming through. And then right. they uncovered it, found stuff. was It was bad. I think they used sandstone originally. Exactly, yeah. And it was in, it was in poor condition. Uh, and so then they said, no, 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 we're going to quarry granite. It's going to be a bigger pain, but we're going to do it. And one of the big reasons this took so long, of course, was there was no railroad. And you find that as time went on, when the railroad finally came to Salt Lake City, they built a spur line that went down to Cottonwood Canyon. And that's when temple construction really, really picked up a lot because that technology enabled them to ship those massive stones. Um, but back to foundations. Right. Uh, you can see I geek out about all this stupid well, stuff. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, well, the coolest, I've noticed this even in temples today. When you see, or any building being built, how much time is spent building the foundation? I have no idea. It's usually the bulk of it. If you ever watch it, like a temple, for example, if it's starting construction, it'll seem like very little is getting done for a very long period of time. Because without a firm foundation, nothing can stand. The Salt Lake Temple is on a deep, very firm foundation. And that's amazing to me because it's not built with steel girders and stuff like that. It's built on a giant granite foundation. And it took forever to do that, but you can't build the temple on top of it without that. And even today, modern day construction, you can watch these buildings go up when it'll seem like they spend years just digging a pit and building this foundation. And then once you start actually building the skyscraper, you look and like, you know, weeks go by and all of a sudden it's just higher and higher and higher. And it's, I feel like there's such a great metaphor there for us just with our relationship with, with God, our spirituality, that uh, we have to build this tight really really strong foundation and a lot of stuff can be built very quickly upon that but of course if we have a weak foundation we'll be like the man who built his house upon the sand yeah the foolish man now and i think that's a really powerful parallel you draw and then you know the idea too that we can't cut corners and i think that's what the other lesson we learned mm. from this right that you know we can't build with sandstone like that, but it yeah. needs to be granted and you can't cut corners with building your foundation in the kingdom of god i mean you know whether that's you know you can't you can't curse you know kind of like quickly read a chapter of whatever book of scripture and compare that to actually really studying exactly and not think that, that you know you're cutting a corner i mean whenever we cut corners we do something to our foundation at least that's what i know for me and that's kind of the lesson i take away when i think about the whole temple building experience yeah and it required so much patience i mean i can't even imagine that i would be so frustrated especially when they had to bury the whole foundation i mean you talk about uh, people who have been spooked enough by their their interactions with the U.S. government, they say, just bury the whole thing. We can dig it back up. It might take some time, but it'll be worth it in the end. I, I would just blow my mind. I mean, oh, yeah. And then to spend can decades dragging giant rocks out of the canyon. And literally. Manually yeah, dragging manually. them. Manually. And then, miles, and then yeah. sitting there without machines, just by hand, chiseling away at granite, putting it together. There are some amazing stories about the Salt Lake Temple. I mean, you know, we can barely even scratch the surface of the amazing things that went down in there. But yeah. uh, one thing I want to encourage people to do, if you ever visit Temple Square, South Visitor Center, they have a model of the, have you ever seen this thing, Dustin? Yeah. There's a full, a big model of the Salt Lake Temple, but it's a cutaway. So you can see the way the rooms are laid out. Just really cool to see and appreciate everything that kind of went into that temple. So we go from the temple in this lesson to talking about the early colonizers in the Utah territory. And this is, you know, just, just equally astounding in terms of sacrifice, in terms of difficulty, in terms of the obedience that the early saints showed in, uh, in, in going to colonize different parts of the area. And, and, you know, in fact, you were just saying, Jeff, you have some ancestors who were early, early Mormon colonizers. Yeah, I am from Mexico. <laughs> it is through my family went down to, to Colonia Juarez, and we are from there. It's good. My, my, my abuela is de allí. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué te ríes así? No hay problemas. No. ¿Te burlas de mí? Anyway. <laughs> Jolín es hombre. Thank you, hermano Openshaw. Um, <laughs> My grandma was raised in the colonies in Mexico. Which okay, is cool. Right, yeah. So, but anyway, I also have a lot of Mormon, uh, Mormon colonizers in my history. And so you think about it here in the Salt Lake Valley, trying to eke out an existence, yeah. right? Trying to build a giant temple. <laughs> That's a tough caboodle. You're going yeah, to Parawan, yeah. buddy. And then the prophet, the prophet you know, tells you to stand up in general conference and sends you off to all different corners of this desert. And the sacrifice involved yeah. and the dedication and the faith to, to do something that didn't seem logical, that didn't make sense, to go build a place for Zion to, to have its foundation um, I think that's pretty remarkable. And I guess that's the thing that I'm thinking about right now. We talked about the foundation of the temple. Yeah. But here was, here was, you know, God pushing his people to build a foundation for his church. 
to build a place where it could be safe, where it could grow, where it could prosper, and then be spread to all yeah. the world. And, uh, you know, a lot we can take away about faith, about tribulation, about building Zion when it's hard. Yeah, and I think it is, it's very interesting to me because after we see uh, on paper, you know, the value of trying to really pool the saints together and say, you know, right. no, be a dense, tight society that is impenetrable, right? Uh, but instead say, no, you know what's going to be better is if we can really colonize larger swaths of territory. And you see this today. I mean, we're, we're really the whole mountain corridor, the whole Mormon corridor, as they call it. I mean, you can go from southern Alberta, Canada, and swoosh all the way down to northern parts of Mexico, and there is a history of Mormon uh, colonialism. And in other, part, other places as well. I mean, you know, like San Bernardino, California, was founded yeah, by Mormons. Totally. Know? So there's a lot of cool stuff. Where did your ancestors, wh- what is your colonial heritage? You Cache Valley. Okay. My ancestors colonized Cache Valley. So are you related to the one, one of the ones we talk about here in the lesson? So I forget the, is it Ch- some, yeah, there's Charles Lowe Walker, Walker and Charles C. Charles Rich. C. One Rich. of them was actually sent up to, I believe, like the yeah. Bear, the Bear Lake Cache Charles Valley. C. That was Charles C. Rich. Okay. I'm not related to him, but I bet he was friends with my ancestor. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy's taking all the credit. He's in the manual. Well, the <laughs> you should be writing the church curriculum department saying, what gives, guys? My people were there, too. My people were humble. Anyway, <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, anyway, <laughs> it was in it was in Charles C. Rich's will. Let it be known that I demand. <laughs> but the the part that I hope that you focus on in your lesson, and I hope if you teach or if someone else is teaching, that you make sure it gets to this. Is this idea at the end in the manual that says, it says, although we're not called to colonize new areas, in what ways are we asked to obey the prophet today? And that's really what it boils down to, right? I mean, we're not asked to colonize and go places, but he asks us to do a lot. Are we willing to step up and do it when it's hard and And build the foundation of Zion? And also ask yourself, if the prophet commanded you and said, no, uproot yourself and go here, where's your faith? Would you be willing to do it? You know, if President Monson showed up here in the D.C. area where the two of us live and said, no, all of you all need to just descend upon Lansing, Michigan and rock the house, we'd just be like, all right, whatever. I mean, I do it. I have that kind of, you know, that's a different example because I think it would be a lot more – arduous i guess to uh settle the deserts but you know what i mean no i know what you mean and you know it's not far-fetched to think we're going to be asked to do things at least equally extreme even if in a different way we will i'll be ready to do it in one way or another a great sacrifice i had my stake my home stake in california had the opportunity years ago to fund the entire construction of the newport beach temple when they built it it's It's the first time the church had done that i think they said since like kirtland or some weird thing like that none of it came out of the temple fund of course they could get away with it a lot of rich people in orange county yada 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 but uh of course it was a sacrifice. And we had to ask ourselves, am I going to do what the Lord's asked me to do here, even if it represents what you could call a second tithe for me? You know, so we've got to ask ourselves what we're willing to do. Well said. Also, building upon that as we close, missionaries made sacrifices to teach the gospel. Uh, lots of cool stories here. If you're reading in Our Heritage, go to pages 84 through 86. There's a section called Missionaries Answer the Call. Definitely worth a read. A lot of cool stories here. Uh, There's the famed story, which I'm going to botch, so I don't know if I dare tell it, but how Lorenzo Snow helped sort of open the hearts of of people in Italy to hear the gospel. Because Lorenzo Snow was sent off to Italy. I don't know if because his first name was Lorenzo, and they said, hey, you should go to Italy, even though no (laughs) one will know you by your first name. Your last name's Snow, which is going to be no help to anyone. But Who knows? um, Yeah, it's amazing, some of these stories. I encourage you to read that. Read also uh, page 93 in our heritage to see some of the, just some stuff about how president Brigham Young led the church, how John Taylor led the church. And, um, really under John Taylor's leadership, the saints continued definitely to, uh, to go teach and, and, and expand the missionary work. Incidentally, John Taylor, the only foreign born president of the church ever. Really? Canadian. British first. Yeah. So there you go. Wow. The only non-American one, John Taylor folks. There's your trivia for the week. It's not Lorenzo Snow. It's not that Italian English guy you're thinking about. <laughs> so, uh, Dustin, do you have anything else you want to say about missionary work? Any of these wonderful topics? No, just I was glad to have a chance to reflect a little bit on what it means to have a temple, what it means to build a foundation, what it means to sacrifice for the kingdom of God. And I'm super grateful for those sacrifices. Me because too. If, if it weren't for my grandma's polygamist father and, her, and, and how they had to fight it out in Mexico. They actually fought like Pancho Villa and stuff like that. Where would I be today? You know, just that, that spirit of pioneer. And, and I, I see within that clan, okay, there's a little bit of kind of a, a self-congratulatory. It's, there's a little bit of sure. that with them, I, I admit. But there is, you get this great sense of gratitude for like what all these kids endured growing up in Mexico, you know, in the early 1900s and figuring stuff out. And I'm so grateful that those saints stuck it out. And we have this rich history in our church that we can learn from. Agreed. So, 
I've talked too much today, Dustin, but I thank you very much for cutting me off. When My pleasure to be, to be here. Folks, we hope you'll join us at thisweekinmormons.com. We also hope you will sign up for our mailing list and for our gospel study sesh group. Dustin doesn't even know about this yet. Exciting news. Yeah, we've been doing this for a while. So uh, if you're not familiar with it, go to thisweekinmormons.com, sign up for our list. What we do is we lead an uh, via email a better study thing. Just as you were talking about, Dustin, not, um, you know, you can't just like blast through a chapter of scripture and get something of it. We're trying to find ways. We're doing ways to get more of a deep dive of our gospel study to improve. So I like anyways, sign up for that, people. It's great to have you with us. Of course, find us at thisweekinmormons.com, facebook.com slash thisweekinmormons. Just Google us with things and find us, and it's good. And I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm good. <laughs> Dustin, thank you for being here. <laughs> Always. This has been Sunday School Bonanza, a This Week in Mormons production uh, in the year 20. 20-